if I just record it like so. A hash, if I just say a hash, notice I'm not saying cryptographic hash. A cryptographic hash is a subset of a hash. Is any function, say f, that takes some like arbitrary length input and maps it on the right to like a fixed length, say of just like one, two, three or something. Anything that does that is a hash function by definition. And cryptographic hashes do this, they're just you know hash functions which are built for cryptographic purposes. So if I have I don't know, oh god wrong one. If I have something like this, like you know I can have arbitrary long length data so I can have hello world, right? As my input. And I put it through a hash function as input through the hash function. And I'm going to get out some code. It's going to be like A, B, C, D. And it's always going to be four bytes long. But notice, I could also provide hello, or just H-E-L into the function. And I'll get back four bytes of data. Or I can put something longer than hello world. Like really long hello and I will still get back four bytes because it's saying variable length input to a fixed length output if a hash or a function sorry satisfies this condition it is said to be a hashing function and Cryptographic hashes are obviously ones functions that do this that have properties that we find useful for, you know, things like comparisons and validity and doing a bunch of stuff like that. So what's the difference between an o what's the difference between the sub function and just the overall hash function? As if it's the same thing, like a cryptographic function is just used to validate the file integrity. Is your car a vehicle? Yes. Is a plane a vehicle? Yes. Are they both cars? No. So a car is a subset of a vehicle, and a plane is a subset of a vehicle, but they're different things, right? One's optimised for flying through the air, and one's optimised for driving on the road. It's the same with functions. Functions is the equivalent of the vehicle, and a cryptographic hash function is one that has the same thing. You know, it transports something from A to B in, like, a, you know, mechanical way, but it has properties which are useful for cryptographic purposes. I focused completely on the wrong thing and went for the cryptography side of it, I guess. Well, that's the problem, isn't it? Because you can have hash lookups and things like Python, right? And hash data structures for when you're looking up... Um, what you call them? So, like, a really good example would be parity. So, you know what parity bits are? Are you saying parrot or parity? Parity. Yes. Texan? Do you know what parity bits are? No. Okay, so like, it literally fits the definition of a hashing function, right? It's a pretty arbitrary one, but it does fit the definition. Say you have some data, let's just say 1011011112. One, 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 let's say 0, right? Can, how many number ones exist in this bit of data or this string? Yeah, so it has just bubbled. It's, it's five. Oh, did he? Sorry, I didn't. Except obviously there's five, right? Um, so there's five bits of data. Oh, sorry, five ones. It's probably a bit better actually if I just get rid of one of these zeros. So this this is. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this is seven bits long. Seven bits. And we say there is five ones in this string or this bit of data, right? Mm -hmm. Well, there's this function called uh, parity checking. And the one we're going to look at today is even parity. So literally the word even, even parity. And what we will do is when we send this data down the wire or across Wi-Fi, whatever it is, we will count 
the number of ones in the data. If there is an odd number of ones, which there is here because five is an odd number, we will add a bit on the end, one, to make it an even number of ones because now, after I've added that data, there is six ones. Yeah? Right. So what, let's say you transfer, you transmit this data from you know, person A to person B and the person receiving this data gets the value one, 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 zero, one, one, one. Right, the the date has changed. In fact, the bit that's changed is this one here. This is flipped from a zero to a one. Make sense? Mm -hmm. We also have this parity bit at the end. So we always know that this entire string, this entire piece of data should always be even. But if we count the ones now, we say, well, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The seven ones, and we know there should be there should be an even number. We don't know how many ones there should be or where they should be. We just know it should be even. So what we do is we know that this data has been corrupted, right? Yes. Make sense? Cool. That's that's called even parity. So that's kind of a really rudimentary... Very, and the really nice thing about it is it's very, very quick. But this kind of meets the conditions for being a hash function because you can take any length of arbitrary data on the left and you're always mapping it on to either a zero or, or a one. Because you can also have cases where you've got, you know, e odd, e it's, if they're already even, zero, zero, one, zero, one, one. Well, there's four bits there, and it's already even. So the parity bit will be zero. But we can also extend this data. We can make this data longer. So we can say, well, this data can be one, one, zero, one, one. And it should be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And this is still even. But the point that I was making before is that this input data on the left can be of any length, but the parity bit on the end is only one byte. And this meets the conditions for being a hash function because you're taking a variable length of data on the left and you're mapping it into a, a fixed length bit of data on the right. Make sense? Mm -hmm. That is so while, the definition of a hash. While we're speaking about this stuff, I could use a refresher. Teach us about Hamming codes and error correct. Hamming codes. Uh, that's a bit of a lesson in its own right. <laughs> so, so I like, don't know you need, but I could like, use a refresher. So I know how they do it, but it's it's a bit of a... It's, it's like error correct using this, what you're describing. You can't error correct. You can error detect. You can error detect one bit change. I thought it was two. Well, I mean, you can guarantee you can change one because, like, the problem is that if only one of these bits changes, then the parity will be wrong, right? Yeah. But if these two bits change, then the parity is correct and the data has been corrupted. So it can only guarantee up to a one bit change, which in a you know in in a data frame of seven bits to one bit, you know, it's like higher than one eighth or one seventh from sorry not one seventh yeah i was using the one bit but yeah yeah, yeah. Having code, would you use like extra parity bits yes they do different. and you can set them but it's a bit of a i don't it's not complicated but it's a bit of a mechanical thing to sort of go through right now um the, the one thing I, the, the easiest way to sort of look at so this is error detection right this cannot correct your errors because it just says that an error occurred it doesn't say where the error totally. occurred right it's like a really good, and I can actually, I can actually remember the name of this, um, this type of error correction. But let me try and think. So, what, what do we need? Uh, let's do nine. So, what we can do is we can transmit um, bits of data here. So, one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, say nine. God, I really wish I could remember what it's called. And you can like arrange these bits in a grid. I think this is how QR codes work, if I remember rightly. And what you do is you map each one of these ones into um, the grid. So we look at the first one here, we map it to one, the zero, zero, uh, one. Actually, I've no, if I've drawn too many, haven't I? Yes, I've drawn too many. Let me just delete that side. 
um, we map this one into one, we map this zero into zero, we map this zero into zero, then zero, zero, one. Yeah? Yes. So what you can do now is you can actually this is kind of this is kind of how Hamming codes work, but not exactly. It's kind of the same principle. Um, what you can do is you can actually like apply uh, actually, if I redraw this in a different way, it's probably going to be better. Let me delete this first string up here. Right? Um, and I drew, I put them in a grid, and then what I do is I go through the grid and check to see which one has to be even or odd. But we're using even parity, right? So if I if I look at if I'm what I'm doing is I'm reading this in the du this direction, right? So I'm reading this left to right, yeah. And what I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, well this needs to be even parity, so. We see that there are two ones in this string here. Uh, let me use a different color. So I'm saying there are two ones. There is one, two, so that's even. So I need to set it to zero, otherwise that would change the even. And I do the same down here. I see, well, there's one, one, so I need a one on the end. And then what I do here is again, I see there's one, one, and I have a one on the end. And I also do this vertically. So now I, now I read it this direction. So I see there's two ones here, one, and one. So this is a zero. The zero's here, so this needs to be a zero, because zero is an even number. And here there's two ones, so it's zero, right? Make sense? No. Did you say kind of? I mean it makes sense, it's just I don't know a lot about binary theory functions. So just count just count the ones. Them. Just count the ones, that's all you need to do. Okay, then yes it makes sense. Just count how many ones there are, because like there are two ones here, and two is an even number. Therefore, if I give it another one, it'll make it an odd number. Right. So I need to set zero because now there is still only two ones in this in this thing here. There's one, two. If I made this a one, then it would no longer be even. So I always need to make it even, right? All right. Are there odd parity functions, or just... yeah, you can you can use odd if you want, yeah. Okay. But I mean, it does the same thing, right? It's it's kind of a bit arbitrary. Yeah. Um. But here's the, here's the really here's the really cool thing about it, right? This actually gives you more power and actually gives you error correcting power, because let's say that this bit here changed to a one, yeah, flipped a bit, right? So now what happens is when the when the computer receives this, they go through and in in this direction they'll count how many ones there are. They'll say, is there an even number of ones here? And there's one, two. So there's two. So this zero is correct. There's an even number of ones. And the next one will say, okay, well, how many ones are there? There's one, two, three ones. And you go, oh, right, that's that's different. This is supposed right. to be even. So we, we say there's like an error in this line here. And then you carry on. You say, okay, well, is there even ones here? You go, there's one, two. So there's two ones. So that's correct. So we know there's an error somewhere on this line, right? And what you do is you start reading it vertically. So again, you go, let's have a look. I'll go vertically, there's one, one, two, one, so it's even, so this check passes. And now we go, how many ones are they? We go, oh, well, there's one, one. So we go, oh, wow, there's an error in this direction, right? So what we do is we now know that if we look, if we do like an XY lookup on here and here, we know this, this bit here is wrong. So it's not a one, so we just flip it. So we flip it back to a zero. And now everything corrects out, right? So this is error correction. You can actually go through and you can correct the error. So this is kind of how Hamming codes work, but they kind of like shift over the bits on one another. Well, sorry, Hamming codes. This is a type of uh, error correction. Like H-A-M-M-I-N-G? Yes, yep. Hamming. Okay. Sorry for the weird question. No, it's fine. I mean, like I said, it, the, this. I mean, this isn't Hamming codes, right? This is sort of one step before yeah. it, but it's quite easy to explain without going into the sort of mm -hmm. linear error correcting codes. Hmm. I was just googling what Hamming codes. Uh, fair enough. Yeah. I don't know what it is, man. That's okay. Twenty-two. So you know what a hash is, you know what the difference between error correction is and, sorry, error correction and error detection. Yeah. Um, so, so the kind of next thing you want to look at is, okay, well, we know what a hash is, right? And 
for all intents and purposes, this, this like even parity thing is a hash because you're mapping a variable amount of data to a single bit of data or a fixed length bit of data. So we go, well, okay, so what, so what do you actually need? So there's, there's, this, there's a really sort of important thing that people need to understand. And this is like a really important thing about hashes. Does anyone know what a mathematical function is, the definition? Or maybe not the exact definition, but sort of give a broad description of what it is. I'm going to guess no, right? So you like one set of numbers to another set of numbers. I wouldn't even say numbers. I'd say you're like you're like converting like one value to another set of values. So you'll have like you can imagine it as like an x y coordinate, right? Because this is why we draw functions. So like you'll have like zero one two three along here or four, and then one two three and four. And let's say this is a function that takes an input f of x and takes like x and all it does is it times is like x by 2 right it just it, you know it gives you 2x right yeah that's all the function does which means you know if, if we input 0 at the bottom it'll give 0 because 0 times 2 is 0 if you put 1 in it'll say okay well 1 times 2 is you know it's 2 if you put 2 in then it's like oh okay well 2 times 2 is 4 and you, you know you get this like constant function it's like straight line graph and it's kind of like a mapping, and kind of in what you said, right? You know, you're, you're taking these like values at the bottom here, or in the x plane, and you're kind of mapping them up here on the y plane. And that's kind of what a function is. It's kind of like a mapping between sets because you can sort of claim that these things down here, you know, are literal just sets of numbers, and that's a set of a number. And it's like this this kind of description where you know this is the output. And this is the input and like you know you have some numbers here and they kind of like map over to numbers over here right and they map right. over here and they map over here yeah yes. Does that makes sense yeah so for things like um 2x at least for natural numbers or natural positive i guess natural positive numbers um well natural numbers are positive but like natural numbers like if you if you times any number in this left hand side, it's always going to equal like a unique value on the right hand side. Like you, you you know you can't get another number which when multiplied by two gives you four right as long as it's like you know above. Well, to be fair, you shouldn't anyway because of negative numbers. But you should never ever be able to get it where it's like you multiply a number here, and it equals the same number over here from something else. You should never get this sort of mapping. Right, it's one to one ratio. It's a one to one ratio. And this has actually got a name. It's said to be injective. In set theory or monomorphic in category theory. But besides the point. But as long as you've got this like one-to-one -one mapping, like every one thing, or not every one thing, but anything that you map here will always map to you know one thing over here. It's said to be injective. And this is really important for understanding cryptographic hashes. In fact, all hashes, right? Because you can have... If we do it sort of in the in this, redraw it so because we've got like an input here and the output you, you've got to imagine that because this is like a variable length size over here this stuff over here is always the same length like you know it's not it's always like you know four bytes long it's always you know mapping into something smaller and a bit like how we had even parity is we basically mapped whatever length of you know values or numbers were into like one byte of information, and the only two values you can ever have in a, you know an even parity is like either one or zero, right? Right. So every single you know sort of string of data that exists over here will either have to map to one or will like have to map to zero. But the point of what I'm trying to make is that the values are actually mapping on to the same things over here, right? Right. So this is really important, right? Which means it's non -in said non-invertible. So you have some variable length item on the left and some fixed length item on the right, and you have this relation, or a function actually, it's technically two. Because they map onto the same thing, you've got two things here. They map onto a single thing over here, 
you can't go backwards, right? You 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 know you can't go backwards because like which path do you pick? Do you pick you know the top path or do you pick the left? You know the the path at the bottom. You have no idea, so you right, can't you go can't backwards. Have one number to two. Yeah, exactly. So like I'm trying to think of a really good example. Um, I mean I mean let's just do even parity again. So that's a really good example. So if I say we you know we've got some data and if I say zero zero, um, this is an even parity, right? So you know I have a parity bit on the end. You know, it's you know the value is one. So let me draw this bigger. This isn't a one; it's like a divider. I... So this maps, you know, the you know the string zero zero into like a fixed length of one, right? Which is the same as having, you know, this set and this this point here is like zero zero, and this yeah. point over here is one, right? And we yeah. say, well, we're mapping this to that. Fine. So let's try a different string. Let's try. 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, right? Well, this is again going to be even parity because there's four ones, right? So we're going to map this function into number one. Yeah, makes sense? But here's the problem, right? So, like, we, we, we have this thing over here on the left, which is, you know, this string here, and we're mapping it in to the number one over here. So, you know, that dot equals the number one, right? So if I if I let's say I deleted this stuff, you know, on the left hand side, and you just received a one, what what does this one map to? It can map to an infinite number of things, right? Including zero zero, one 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 one, like you know, zero one one zero. Zero 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 zero, like one one. It can always map, or actually that's incorrect, but it's need to be odd, odd, odd parity. But it can map into sort of all these things. If I give it things like this, uh, so it can always map into these things, right? You, you know, it, it can't go backwards because you'll never know which one to pick, right? right. Makes sense. Yes. So here's a really important concept. And we've not got to cryptographic caches, right? But this is an important concept. Let's say you've got some password. Let's just say password one. And something is password. Yeah. Let's say it's password one, right? And we hash it. We have like some hash function here. And we like push it through this function. And it outputs the data, I don't know, like 7x32, for instance. And then let's say we had another, you know, another password like Hunter One, and we map this in, and this maps to eight four e seven. Yeah. But here's the problem: because it's a hash, because you're taking a variable length data on the left and mapping it into a fixed length data on the right, much like the even parity I was showing you before. You actually can't go backwards. You can't have a hash and then go back to the password. This is why hashes are irreversible because they can. So your one hash can put in, output multiple values, but your fix your input variable can only goes one way. Yes. That's why hashes aren't reversible. Yes, because you don't actually know what they would map to. Now some are you know some are reversible in a sense like non cryptographic ones you can reverse them right like right I you can give me a one and I can just give you any string and go in an even parity hash or even parity function anything with an even odd number of ones will satisfy this condition but you can't do that with cryptographic hashes because it would be broken right because like what happens in a database is you know you've you've got a web page right and you you know you type in your username and password. You you never want to actually have to store the password in the clear text. You never want to store it as the actual password. You'll have some database on the back end, and you'll have some tables. You'll have like a database here. You know, and you'll, you'll have some tables, right? And you'll enter a password, right? You'll have some password one. Yeah. Yeah. And when you sign up, you you know you enter the password password one, and it stores your user ID over on the right hand side and password one will map to the value I don't know let's just say 0x7e34 right 
that's what it maps to. That's what this equals in that direction. And then let's say you have another password, right? And let's say there's another user, you know, user number one, and he has a password hunter too. And this is also going to map to like some unique value. So this unique value is going to equal 0x1134, right? And that's only over in that direction. So you don't so you don't actually need to know what the passwords are, right? So what happens is you come in next time and you log into your page and you go, I'm user number, you know, user number one, and you type in your password hunter two. You run it through the hashing function, and out pops zero. Uh, is it zero x one one three four? And what the database will do then is it will compare this value to see if those values match. Yeah. That was a long MP5, right? That what? Wasn't that like one of the problems that MD5 had that you could put it through? Yeah, yeah, so I don't I'm I'm not gone on to that yet. Yeah, Texan, carry on. You had a question. So if you can't reverse I think I'm thinking too much into this, but if you can't reverse a cryptographic hash, how are there rainbow tables? Is it just from people taking a, a fucking generic password with a hashing algorithm, hash, ha, uh, finding out the hashes and saving it in a rainbow table. Yep. Is that all? They're that's doing? literally okay. what a rainbow table is. Okay. So, so well, that, that's. that's need to take the word. Yeah, like, like, and they're doing it a lot. Um, it, yeah, rain, ra colleges are doing it. Well, rainbow tables kind of don't work anymore just because, like, of something called salting and peppering and a bunch of other stuff. And you know, I, I won't go into that yet. But like, this gives you a way to distinguish. You know, whose password's password? Because you know, password one maps it's to zero x seven e three four. As long as you use the same hashing function, right? If you use two different functions, right. they would change. But yeah, and then you and then the computer can compare and say, oh, you're you are user, and you you must know that password, right? Because it generates that hash. Yeah? yeah. So like, let's say you actually use a you know a really weak hashing algorithm instead. Um, and let's say that if I enter, I don't know, I'm trying to think, let me in. Let's say with our really weak hashing function, this also generated the value 0x7e34. Now, when the backend computer goes down the list and compares the functions, it will actually see that, you know, that password's correct, right? Even if it isn't password one, like it just it hashes to the same value as password one hash to, and therefore you've got what's called a collision, which is what Insomnia was on about. Okay. You have this thing that like collides and causes a problem, because you don't even need to know the password. You just need some data that you can enter that generates the same hash, and that's right. what's important. Does that make sense? So when, so when this like takes you onto a thing, so this is one of the things, right? When I talk about cryptographic hashing, one of the properties of a cryptographic hash is that you know you've got to have a very high resistance to this collisions. So it must be very very difficult to find two values, you know, password one and let me in that map, you know, to the same to the same hash, right? Mm -hmm. So this is one of the sort of strengths of it. There also, it also can't be predictable. So like, if I just changed the value, let's say, password one to password two, it shouldn't change. It shouldn't be exactly the same, bar one character, for instance. So seven e three five, where this was, you know, the previous character, and this is the character after. It shouldn't right. do that. It should. It should give me a completely random bit of data. So I've, you know, I've made a very small change in the initial password, which means the output of the hash should be completely different. So examples, is there X, A915, or 4, let's say, actually. This should be completely different, and it is. You know, we're saying that, or we're proposing that our hash or hashing function, or cryptographic hashing function, is resistant to collisions, so 
two values or two passwords don't generate to the same value and they aren't generated in a predictable way. You know, a small change to the input will be a very large change to the output. And you can you can see this on things like um, uh, just Linux. So if I just if I just log myself in, if I just I gotta go, man. I gotta be in like a minute. Alright, cool. Well, I'll just carry on and I'll upload the video. Well, I appreciate it. So uh, you know, a good example might be um, I'm going to just type in the word password password one. I'm going to use SHA two five six sum. This generates, you know, a very long hash. But I can also change it, so I change password 1 to password 2, and this generates an enormously different hash. And this is the sign of a good cryptographic hash function. And it should also be very, very difficult for me if I ran this in some sort of loop. For instance, if I said, um, is it sequence uh, 0 to 100? So if I did something like this, for, uh, I don't know, G for guess in this value, uh, let's say password uh, G, and then we do a SHA256 sum. None of these hashes here will be even remotely be the same. Like none of these will collide with each other. And I've just generated on the fly 100 different passwords that are very similar. And all of them generate very large differences in the output. And none of them are going to be the same. In fact, I don't think we have even found a collision for SHA-256 yet. And there's a lot of people with very big supercomputers that are trying to identify them. In fact, even if we say we've used all of the computing power in the world and we've used all of Google and Amazon's data centers, and we found one single collision, that's already too weak. That means that already we should be upgrading our hash functions. In fact, this has happened with... Is it happened? It might have happened with SHA-1, but it's definitely happened with MD5. I think it has happened with SHA-1. Yeah, which means that we shouldn't be using SHA-1 anymore, because this happened. Isn't that why we have SHA-256? I mean, they were already upgrading. We already knew that it was kind of weak because computers were becoming more powerful. It was just that Google spent like 90 days of computing power and a bunch of sort of like described weaknesses and said, oh, hey, we found one. Um, we need to, you know, really move to sort of SHA-256. But a lot of people still use MD5 and, you know, that's even worse than SHA-1 was. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, the other thing I like to say to people is, is sort of like, this is the difference between, you know, this is an encryption. Number one, this is not encryption because you're not taking any key and it's not a two way function, right? Like encryption should always be able to be decrypted. So like you should be able to go back and forth. You should always be able to go, oh, well, like, you know, I can encrypt to some data and I can go backwards provided I've got some, you know, key. Right. But that's not the case. Hashes are one way and they should, you know, for cryptographic purposes, they should be strong and should avoid collisions and a bunch of other things and then people go oh, well how do you, you know if you don't have a key like how do you guess them and it's like what it's what Texan said before it's you have just erase this you have a really long list of passwords much like what I've just done you know you got password one one you know two three four duh, 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 passwords are all the same and you just go in a loop. So you have some hash value, let's say the hash value is 0x73e4, and what you're doing is you, you're going down the list and just saying, okay, well, I'm going to you know, hit the first one, I'm going to generate the, you know, the hash, but this first one generated 0xa256, for instance. You get to the next one, you say, okay, well, you know, this function generated 0x9374. And then you get to this one and it says, oh, this one generated 73E4, which means the hash that generates 73E4, at least in this context, is probably going to be password 3. So this is just cracking, right? But the other thing that Texan mentioned is that, well, you can do this every time. You can turn around and go on site and say, I'm going to go and try and crack all your passwords. Or you can pre-compute these. Before you go and do a pen test or before you go and attack something, 
in fact this is kind of like what happened with Wi-Fi when SSIDs are all the same, is what you could do is you could say, well, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to re I'm just going to compute these. I'm just going to take huge lists of passwords that I'm just going to randomly generate. Like you're going to generate all characters A to Z, you know, capital A to Z and zero to nine, up to ten characters long, and you're just going to run them through the MD5 algorithm and just store them on like a 400 gigabyte hard drive or you know, or, you know, or like a let's say 400 terabyte hard drive or something, right? It should probably be that big. But it means that instead of you having to need to generate all this computing power, you just have this, you know, equivalent lists of hashes on the output. You look for the hash that you want and you go, oh, you know, th that hash matches. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to enter that password and it makes it very, 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 very quick to be able to look stuff up. In fact, when you look for hashes on Google, this is kind of what you're doing because someone's already pre-computed that hash and you're just using the Google search engine as this like index look lookup for hashes. That makes sense. Yep. Cool. Toasty boy. Are you he's quiet. He's not speaking. I know he's not speaking. Uh, nah, I'm, I'm listening to fucking uh Yeah, I knew like the the around it. I didn't know like the actual details of it. Yeah. So this is helpful and shit. So, so you know, so that's so that's hashing, right? That's changing passwords and all that really fun stuff that you know people always teach it wrong and they go, "Oh, a hash function does this," and I go, "Well, technically it doesn't, right?" Because then it becomes really confusing when people hear programming terms when they say, "Oh, like hash table or something," and you go, "Oh, that must mean it's really secure." And it's like, "Well, it's not. It's just a hash table, like it's a function that does a hash, and this is what it means." Is that all cool with everyone? 